Brothers and sisters, welcome. Sorry for the technical difficulties we had. Uh, we had a short and a cable, so thank you for your patience and welcome to our lectures about the Doctrine and Covenants by Brother Stevens. We're grateful for him and being here. My name is Brother Bryce Anderson. I'm from the Stake Sunday School Presidency and we'll be conducting. Um, we will go ahead and begin by saying an opening prayer and I'll provide that this morning or this evening. Our kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we're grateful for the opportunity to gather together and to learn about the Doctrine and Covenants and to be able to understand the history of the church and those things that unfolded and revelations that occurred. We're grateful for the opportunity to apply them to our lives and be able to improve ourselves and have a broader understanding of thy gospel and all that thou hast prepared for us. We're grateful for the doctrine of salvation and for temples and for the miracles we have in our lives. Father, please bless thy spirit will be here this day that will be inspired and will be able to understand and comprehend the things that Brother Stevens teaches and presents. Please bless him with the Holy Ghost that he will be able to convey those thoughts and feelings which he has prepared. And these things we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Brothers and sisters, uh, in the past we've tried, or I've tried to do six or seven of the sections of Doctrine and Covenants. We won't be able to do that this evening because of section 76. Uh, being so doctrinal and, and uh, fairly long. So we'll cover 75 and 76. So we'll start in section 75 this evening, which is addressed to the full-time missionaries that the Savior is going to call. I will not take the time or the luxury to explain all of the individuals that's involved in this section, but I will a couple of them. But I want to start up here in the heading tonight. Revelation given through Joseph Smith the prophet at Amherst, Ohio, January 25th, 1832. At this conference, Joseph Smith is sustained and ordained president of the high priesthood. The significance of that is that is the beginning of what will formally become the first presidency of the church. If you want to make a note with that, it's Sidney Rigdon himself who will ordain Joseph Smith as president of the high priesthood. The reference on that is that same day, January 25, 1832, Journal History of the Church. The journal history is a day-by-day -day account of the history of the church located in the historical library in Salt Lake. It was started by Andrew Jensen. That is open to the public, and they can go through it. I worked on it for about three years. I've been through about 40 years of it, and then because of other assignments, I wasn't able to finish. Let's start now in verse 2. Hearken, O ye who have given your names to go forth to proclaim my gospel and to prune my vineyard. To prune means to make beautiful and to make productive. In this case, the missionaries are sent forth to do that, in preparation for the second coming of the Son of God. In verse 3 through 5 are directed to the missionaries. Behold, I say unto you, as my will, that you should go forth and not tarry. To not tarry means don't delay and don't hesitate or find something else to do. Neither be idle, which means to be lazy. Labor with your mind. To labor with one's mind is to be enthusiastic and full of energy. Lifting up your voices with the sound of a trump, which means to be clear and so you can be heard. Proclaiming the truth according to the revelations and commandments which I have given you. And thus, if ye are faithful, ye shall be laden with many sheaves as converts and crowned with honor and glory and immortality and eternal life. To be crowned with honor and glory has reference to becoming a king a king who will reign and rule in the eternities to come, who will have immortality and eventually eternal life. Verse 6 through 12 is addressed to William McClellan and Luke Johnson, who are called to labor together without spending much time on the history that William McClellan is lazy. He doesn't fulfill the mission, and the Savior eventually will call a different companion for Luke Johnson. Let's go down to verse 13. Again, verily thus saith the Lord, let my servant Orson Hyde and my servant Samuel H. Smith 
take their journey into the eastern countries, proclaim the things which I have commanded them. Inasmuch as they are faithful, lo, I will be with them even unto the end. And these two men are indeed faithful. Here's just a, a, a small glimpse of what they did. They will meet with some of Orson Hyde's family. They met with his brother Asel to teach him he rejects the gospel. They then met with Orson's sister, Laura North, and her husband. Both of them rejected the gospel, which was a heartache to this great man. They established a branch in Boston with between 25 to 30 members. On this mission, they traveled mostly by foot 2,000 miles to teach the everlasting gospel. They built up four branches and they baptized 60 people. Two of those they baptized become very important to us in church history. Their names are Agnes Kulbrith and Mary Bailey. Agnes Kulbrith will marry Don Carlos Smith, the youngest of the Smith brothers. Mary Bailey will marry Samuel Smith. And so they become very, very prominent people. Verse 14, again, verily I say unto my servant Lyman Johnson, and unto my servant Orson Pratt, they shall also take their journey into the eastern countries. And behold, and lo, I am with them also, even unto the end. Here's a synopsis of their missionary labors. They traveled 4,000 miles. They went into Ohio, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, New York, and New Hampshire on this mission. They baptized 104 people. I listed just a few that are so... Uh, prominent in church history. They are Winslow Farr, his son Lauren Farr. He's 11 years old. Lauren Farr later at Far West will live with the prophet Joseph Smith. Later he'll become the mayor in Ogden and the first stake president of the Weber district, which at that time uh, included Morgan also. We were in that uh, stake that he presided over. Uh, William Snow, who will serve in the Utah legislature, he will eventually be the bishop in Pine Valley, if you've ever been down that way. That is a uh, historical place. And he will serve uh, as a patriarch. They baptized Zerubbabel uh, Snow. Uh, he marched in Zion's camp. He will become the attorney general uh, in Utah territory. And he is a cousin of Lorenzo Snow. They baptized Anson Pratt, that's the oldest brother of Orson and Parley P. Pratt. They baptized Hazen Aldrich, he also marked in Zion's camp. He'll be one of the seven presidents, uh, remember they were organized February 28, 1835. Two days later they organized the seven presidents and he was one of those. They baptized Amasa Lyman, who eventually will serve just for a brief period as a counselor to Joseph Smith and later a member of the Quorum of the Twelve. Daniel S. Miles, he was one of the seven presidents, died a very faithful member, 1845 in Illinois. That gives you just a brief synopsis of some of their missionary labors, and those are the only ones that I chose uh, in the section to deal with. There's a lot of information on some of the others, but I don't have, feel like I have the time because I want to cover section 76. Let's come over to verse 18 through 22, which is general instructions to missionaries. In 18, uh, second line, third line, excuse me, here's the first thing. They are to go from house to house, from village to village. In other words, it's a very tedious process, but a very thorough process. Verse 19, second line, leave, uh, and they receive your leave, uh, your blessing upon that house. So they are to leave a blessing on the homes of those who receive them. 20. Uh, and in whatsoever house ye enter, and they receive ye not, ye shall depart speedily from that house. Here's number three. Shake off the dust of your feet as a testimony against them. Remember I told you and give you the reference, and I will again, missionaries are not to do that. Uh, that will require general authority if that's to be done. The reference for that is Jesus the Christ, page 345. Jesus the Christ, page 345. 
21, you shall be filled with joy and gladness and know this, that in the day of judgment, here's number four, ye shall be judges of that house and condemn those, those who heard and rejected. Missionaries will stand as a witness against them. 22, shall be more tolerable for the heathen in the day of judgment than for that house. Heathen always has reference, by the way, to Gentiles. Therefore, gird up your loins, be faithful. Ye shall overcome all things and be lifted up at the last day. Reference to the second coming, reference to the final judgment, reference to being taken back into the presence of the Father. Again, thus saith the Lord unto you, O ye elders of my church, who have given your names, that you might know his will concerning you. Behold, I say unto you that it is the duty of the church to assist in supporting the families of those and also to support the families of those who are called. That has always been the case, and even in our day, families are to support their sons and their daughters or parents as they serve in the mission field. At one time, the missionaries were sent without purse or script. It was changed under the direction of President Brigham Young because of missionaries in England taking advantage of the saints and getting rich. And President Young put a stop to it and told the missionaries they had to pay their own ways. And that's when that change comes and we see that uh, take place in the church. Now, verse 29. Let every man be diligent in all things. Diligent means to be consistent. And the idler shall not have place in the church except he repent and mends his ways. The idler is members who will not help in this work. That's what it has reference to. All of us can help with the missionary work. You can help by your prayers. You can help uh, financially by contributing to help in third world countries where young people are called who do not have much and we're able to help them as a result. Now we come to section 76. Just by way of historical background, the revelation was given in the home of John Johnson at Hiram, Ohio. We own the home. We have full-time missionaries, couples, uh, and younger sisters who were there to take people on tours. Philo Dibble was an eyewitness to this vision. He said there were about 12 others in the room. He said the vision lasted o for over one hour. He said, I could see the glory. In other words, he could see uh, the countenance of Joseph and uh, Sidney and the glory that was on them. He didn't see anything of the vision. He said, I could hear them as they would talk to each other about what they were seeing. He said, I noticed that Sidney Rigdon was as limp as a dish rag when the prophet turned and saw him and he smiled and he said, oh, Sidney's not as used to it as I am. And I thought, boy, I'll bet that's true. Joseph Smith said that he could explain a hundredfold more than I ever have of the glories of the kingdoms manifested to me in the vision where I permitted and were the people prepared to receive them. So we have a summary of what it was that he witnessed and saw. That quote comes out of the History of the Church, volume 5, page 402, volume 5, page 402. Now uh, one more by way of an introduction. Section 76 is the commentary on the following references. Genesis 28, verse 10 through 13. Genesis 28, 10 through 13. John 14, verse 1 and 2. John 14, verse 1 and 2. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 40 to 42. 1 Corinthians 15, 40 to 42. 2 Corinthians 12, 1 through 4. 2 Corinthians 12, 1 through 4. We would never have understood any of those four references if it was not for this great revelation. I might mention, too, there were some negative feelings concerning the revelation. When some new converts found out that there were other places of glory for God's children on the earth other than heaven and hell, they left the church. Because now that they joined the church, they would go to heaven and everybody else to hell. And all I have to say to that is if you are that narrow in your thinking, it's best that you leave. And to go into one of the lower kingdoms. There has never been a president of this church give a revelation dealing with the entire church that we did not have somebody leave. 
because they disagreed with the revelation or it wasn't in harmony with their thinking and their understanding. Wilford Woodruff said this concerning this vision. He said, I will refer to the vision alone as a revelation which gives more light, more truth, and more principle than any revelation contained in any other book we ever read. That comes out of Journal of Discourses, volume 22, page 146, volume 22, page 146. One more note that you want, might want to make. W.W. Phelps later will write a letter to the prophet, and he said, all prophets have written poetry but you. Joseph Smith sat down, took section 76, and put it in poetic verse. And it's important that you look at that because he adds doctrinal insights to interpretation of some of these verses. Here's the reference where you can read the, po the poetic version. I'll give you two references. One you probably won't have access to, but the other one you can. The Times and Seasons, Volume 4, page 81 to 88. Times and Seasons, Volume 4, 81 to 88. That one will be a little harder for you. The other one is N.B. Lundwall, The Vision. It's a little book that he wrote. That's got the entire poem in it. N.B. Lundwall, The Vision. I'd assume if you go online, you probably can find that. I've been observing, occasionally I look at ksl.com, people are getting rid of their books. They, they don't want them anymore. Everything is uh, on the internet and that, and so it's a storage problem, I guess, for them. They don't read them. And you can get a lot of those books for 2 and 3 and $4, and some of them are very valuable books. Okay, with that much of an introduction, let's start in a section 76 and do what we can with it he says hear O ye heavens give ear O earth note the ramifications heavens surely deals with those in the paradise and the spirit world perhaps uh, the city of Enoch and maybe other areas that once were involved here that we don't know about as well as the earth and the members here Rejoice ye inhabitants thereof, for the Lord is God. Now, remember I suggested to you, if you want to fully understand scriptures, you must know the meaning of the titles of deity. Lord means ruler or governor. God denotes a supreme being who's all-powerful. And he said, and beside him there is no savior. He is the one who overcome the effects of the fall. He overcame first spiritual death and second physical death. The terrible, terrible suffering that he experienced in Gethsemane and on the cross was to satisfy the demands of justice and to overcome spiritual death. When he said it is finished, he hadn't finished the atonement process, but he had finished satisfying the demands of the law of justice. He had overcome spiritual death uh, for you and I. And then he willingly started the second process of the atonement, and that was to physically die and to yield up the spirit. When he came out of the tomb as a resurrected being, he had completed the atonement process. Verse 2, great is his wisdom, marvelous are his ways, the extent of his doings none can find out. Here's a quick example of that. The loss of the 116-page manuscript that Martin Harris lost. Remember in the Book of Mormon, the Savior was prepared for that. Told Nephi that he was to make a second account of the small plates. Nephi wasn't sure why. Remember when Mormon found the small plates, he felt impressed to add them. He didn't know why, but for a wise purpose in God. The Lord didn't tell either prophet why. Today we know the loss of the 116 pages. The Lord intended we have the small plates all along. That's a great example. Verse 3, his purposes fail not, which means he has all power. Neither are there any who can stay his hand. From eternity to eternity, he is the same, which means this. He is a God of truth. He never changes. His years never fail. There will never be a time in which he is not God. For thus saith the Lord, I, the Lord, am merciful, kind, and gracious, that means love, 
unto those who fear me. Fear means respect. It means more than that, but with the English language, that's the best we can do. Delight to honor those who serve me in righteousness and in truth unto the end. There's the great challenge for all of us as members of the church to serve until the end of our mortal probation, that we will be welcomed one day into the paradise where we will continue to grow and to learn. Now comes promises to the faithful. Great shall be their reward. Eternal shall be their glory, which means eternal life, which means that there will come a time in eternity when we will finally become like the Savior. To them will I reveal all mysteries. I have no idea what all that includes, but that's a great promise to us. There isn't anything he'll withhold from us in due time. Yea, all the hidden mysteries of my kingdom from days of old and for ages to come will I make known unto them the good pleasure of my will concerning all things pertaining to my kingdom. Here's another promise. Yea, even the wonders of eternity President Kimball said it has never entered the heart of a human being what God has and what God does. And things to come will I show them, even the things of many generations. Imagine that. God lives in a realm where everything is before his eyes, past, present, and future. We cannot fathom how it is he knows the future and can gaze upon the future long before it ever happened. He's promised us the same privilege. Verse 9, their wisdom shall be great, their understanding reach to heaven. Heaven is the celestial worlds. Our wisdom and knowledge will reach into celestial realms where we will begin to know the mysteries of godliness. 10, for by my spirit will I enlighten them, which means this, that we will be able to understand the things which he will show us and the things which he will teach us. Miss a line or two, even those things which eye has not seen, <clears throat> nor ear heard, nor yet entered into the heart of man. There are some things our Father in heaven has held in reserve. He has not uh, had his son show them to any of the prophets. They've been held in reserve for all of us as an exalted family. And by the way, the Savior there is quoting his prophets Isaiah and Paul. The references is Isaiah chapter 64, and it's verse uh, 14. You might want to make a note with that. It's 14 or 24. I can't read my own notes. I wrote this so many years ago. And 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. We, Joseph Smith Jr. and Sidney Rigdon, being in the Spirit, so they can see, they can understand. Twelve, by the power of the Spirit, our eyes were opened. And then he says, to see and understand the things of God. Now note verse 13. Even those things which were from the beginning before the world was. So the vision starts with pre-earth life. And I'll show you some of what he was willing to tell us on that. Moves through the mortal probation and then to the degrees of glory and to our exaltation. All of that's going to be found in here which were ordained to the Father through his only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, which means he was the one closest to the Father. He is the one that Abraham 3 says had become like God himself. Now partway down the verse it says, the gospel of Jesus Christ, who is the Son, whom we saw, with whom we conversed in the heavenly vision. They see the Savior, they're permitted to talk to him, and he teaches them. For while we were doing the work of translation, that's the JST, they're translating the Bible, we came to the 29th verse of the 5th chapter of John. 16, speaking of the resurrection of the dead, concerning those who shall hear the voice of the Son of Man, shall come forth they who have done good, in the resurrection of the just. And so I remind you again what that is, and then I'll tell you why I'm doing this. The resurrection of the just is celestial and terrestrial. They stand uncondemned. They, they are justified. 
They who have done evil in the resurrection of the unjust, they stand condemned. They are telestial and perdition. Now, that verse is the introduction to what's going to follow here in a minute, where he's going to cover perdition, the kingdom of outer darkness, and the three degrees of glory, where these individuals will reside. Now, this caused us to marvel, for it is given unto us of the Spirit. And while we meditated upon these things, the Lord touched the eyes of our understanding, they were opened. The glory of the Lord shone round about. We beheld the glory of the Son on the right hand of the Father. Who could imagine what that was like? Now they see the Father and the Son. So Sidney Rigdon is permitted to see our Heavenly Father and the Savior on his right hand. Saw the holy angels and them who were sanctified before his throne. That would be hard to comprehend what all that entailed and what all it was that they were permitted to see. 22, and now after the many testimonies which have been given of him, this is the testimony last of all which we give of him, that he lives. For we saw him even on the right hand of God. Now that's important. To be on the right hand, the right hand is the covenant hand. Christ is the heir, so he stands on the right hand of the Father. If we are faithful, we become joint heirs with him, and we will stand on the right hand of the Son of God. We heard the voice bearing record. He is the only begotten of the Father. That has reference to his physical body. He obtained from the Father in mortality and thus becomes the incarnate God. That by him, through him, and of him, the worlds are and were created, and the inhabitants thereof are begotten sons and daughters unto God. In other words, Christ created worlds without number. His atonement doesn't just apply to this earth, but to all of the worlds that he has created. And those on all of those worlds who accept his gospel and meet the qualifications in section 25, verse 1, become the spiritual sons and daughters of Christ, and he shares his birthright with who? Millions upon millions upon millions and millions of people on who knows how many worlds that we're even talking about. His atonement was, even though happened on this earth, does not just apply here. He atoned for all of the creations of the Father, past, present, and into the future. His atonement was infinite. There is no end to it. That is a significant verse. All of those worlds that he created, the atonement applies to them. All of the members of the church on all of those worlds who meet the conditions recorded in section 25, verse 1, become the spiritual sons and daughters of Christ, and thus they are joint heirs also. 24, that by him and through him and of him the worlds are and were created. The inhabitants there are begotten sons and daughters unto God. I would put by that DNC 25, verse 1. Now, starting with 25, we began to uh, see what caused the war in heaven and the role that Satan played. And what we're going to look at is unique. 25, and thus we saw also and bear record that an angel of God who was in authority in the presence of God who rebelled against the only begotten son. Let's turn to the book of Moses, chapter 4 and see exactly what that means and how he rebelled against the only begotten Son. And this becomes very, very important for you and I to understand what all happened in pre-earth life. Verse 1, Moses 4, verse 1. And I, the Lord God, spake unto Moses, saying, That Satan, whom thou hast commanded, in the name of mine only begotten, is the same which was from the beginning. He came before me, saying, Behold, here am I, send me, I will be thy son. There it is. And that is so easy to miss if we're not careful. What was it he asked for in pre-earth life? He wanted the position of the firstborn son of God. He wanted the great Jehovah's position. You and I on that occasion must stood with our mouths open 
not believing we just heard what he asked for. The scriptures are clear that the great Jehovah was like the Father himself. Satan was not equal to that. He thinks he's come up with a loophole in the Father's plan whereby he'll take away our agency and bring us all back. Now, I heard members say he was going to force us back. You can't read where it says that. I think that Satan was too clever to use the nasty word force. Nobody to listen to him. He's far more clever than that. What his plan was all about, I don't know, and I'm sure our Father in Heaven has no intentions of telling us. I can just see members of this church, if that his bright ideas was given to us, members would say, well, you know, I don't agree with all of that, but some of what he said makes sense. That's the way we are. We're an interesting, funny people at times. So I don't know what it was about. I just know he's going to take away agency. So here's what causes the war. One, he wants the birthright position. He wants the great Jehovah's birthright, which automatically carries with it what? The airship. It all belongs to him. The loophole he uses to get the father to give it to him is that under the father's plan, he's going to lose too many. But Satan's thought of a way to save us all. And thus he is to be the son. Now, thank goodness for that verse right there, which helps unlock this one over here. So let's go back to section 25. And note again in the middle of it, who rebelled against the only begotten son. I would put Moses 4 verse 1 there. He wanted the birthright position. We would have been greatly offended at that. In fact, I believe that in large part that's what caused the war, is him being so greedy and so power hungry, trying to get that position away from the Savior, whom the Father loved and who was in the bosom of the Father, was thrust down. No, he wasn't asked to leave. He was thrown out, as he should have been from the presence of God in the Son, and was called perdition. Perdition means loss or destruction. Loss or destruction. The heavens wept over him. It was not a pleasant moment for the father to lose so many of his children. He was Lucifer, and I would catch that. It's the only place it teaches it. He was Lucifer. That is not his name. Lucifer means light bearer or shiny one. He was one of the noble and the great ones. That name, Lucifer, was a good name. It's not anymore. Nobody's going to name one of their children in this church Lucifer and go around explaining, well, let me tell you, that one time's a good name. This is what it means. He's ruined it. But I would catch that he was Lucifer. That is not his name anymore. A son of the morning, and we ought to catch that. He was not the son of the morning. He is not greater than the mighty Michael or Enoch or Noah or Adam or Joseph Smith or maybe 10,000 others. Because he's one of the noble and the great doesn't mean he was greater than a host of others. He was a son of the morning, not the son. And that's important to catch. And we beheld, and lo, he has fallen, is fallen. And I wish I could show you that somehow, but I don't know if you watch my hand when it says he has fallen, has fallen. It means this. He's going lower and lower and lower and darker and darker. There is no light in him at all. In his realm is a realm of darkness, which is a terrible darkness. Even a son of the morning, how is it that he could fall? While we're yet in the spirit, the Lord commanded us we should write the vision, for we beheld Satan, which means adversary or spoiler. That old serpent, which means sly and cunning and crafty, and those are important, you'll see in just a minute. Even the devil, and that name means slanderer, slanderer, who rebelled against God and sought to take the kingdom of our God and his Christ. Wherefore, he, the antecedent of he, is those three names. I would circle he, and then I'd draw a line to each one of those names from he. Maketh war of the saints of God, and compass them round about. Here's how to diagram that. Draw your round circle. In the circle, put the saints. And then in three different places around the circle, write those names. Satan, serpent, and devil, and point them uh, to the circle. In other words, he surrounds us as what? Our adversary, and a spoiler. 
He surrounds us as one who's sly and cunning and crafty. He slanders us as the devil. Do you know what the great example of that is? For years, especially in the southern states, they kept saying that what? We're not Christians. Imagine the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is not Christians. That is slander at its peak, and the devil is the one that was responsible for that. He encompassed them round about. Let's turn for a minute to the book of Revelation. He is a formidable uh, adversary. You never underestimate Satan. You play by all of the rules. I used to tell my missionaries, play by the rules and you'll come away victorious. But if you don't, you will lose. If you think you're a match for him, then you don't understand. Okay, Revelation 12. This deals with pre-earth life. I'm going to start with verse 9. And the great dragon was cast out. Note that old serpent called the devil and Satan which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Now come down to 11. And they, they, uh, the antecedent of they is brethren in 10, and in 7, Michael and his angels. Okay, they are the faithful that fought against him. They win the conflict against this adversary three ways. Here it is. And they overcame him, the antecedent of him is serpent, devil, and Satan. They overcame him, one, by the blood of the Lamb, the atonement of Christ. Two, by the word of their testimony, which means their faith in Christ. And three, they loved not their lives unto the death, which means they were willing to sacrifice everything for the kingdom of God. That's how we will become victorious over the evil one. Now verse 30, back in section 76. And we saw a vision of the sufferings of those, the antecedent of those, is saints in verse 29. So I would circle those and draw a line from those to saints. Now you've got all of the antecedents tied in. The suffering of those with whom he, remember who he is, Satan, serpent, and devil, with whom he made war and over war and overcame, for thus came the voice of the Lord unto us. Do you know what the sadness is of that verse thirty? Do you know who one of those is that he overcame? Sidney Rigdon, who was watching all of this and seeing it in September eighteen forty four, because of his rebellion, refusing to uphold the quorum of the twelve, they held uh, a disciplinary council, and he'll be excommunicated. And when he was, Brigham Young said, I now turn Sidney Rigdon over to the buffetings of the devil until the day of redemption shall come in his behalf. And that is terrifying. And he did not come back to the kingdom. His son John Rigdon did. His son John Rigdon will speak down here in the tabernacle in general conference in the very early 1900s. Now, starting with verse 31, we turn to perdition. So we want to be careful that we do not tie in verse 25 through 30 with perdition. It deals with pre-earth life. It deals with Satan's role to destroy the members of the church. Starting with verse 31, the Lord will turn his attention now to those who become perdition. I suggest to you tonight, brothers and sisters, that this is the information that we know and have on perdition. We don't want to go outside of this. There's only one man the Savior has ever told us is perdition, and that's Cain. Was Judas perdition? I don't know. I know that uh, James E. Talmadge and Orson Pratt thought that he was. I know that Joseph F. Smith and his son Joseph Illing Smith didn't think that he was. So what does that tell you? We don't know. Here's four mighty apostles with different opinions. One of the fastest ways I know to waste your time is to sit and wonder if Judas is perdition. That doesn't benefit or help us. I've often thought if Peter was to come to Sunday school one time and say, you've always wanted to know, so I'm going to answer that for you, and then he answers it. And after he has, now what? Doesn't help at all, does it? Doesn't help. 
Cain is the only one that we know. Everything else is guessing, which you and I don't want to do. We have not yet been given authority to assign anybody to their kingdoms. Okay, 31, here we go. Thus saith the Lord concerning all those who know my power, which means they've seen or heard or experienced, and two have been made partakers thereof, suffered themselves. Suffered means permitted, willingly they did this. Suffered themselves through the power of the devil, meaning they allowed or permitted him to be overcome. When they are, they do this. They deny the truth and they defy my power. They become rebels like Satan was in pre-earth life. They are they who are the sons of perdition, of whom I say it had been better for them never to have been born. Now imagine the great God of heaven saying that. It would have been better for them never to have been born. Joseph Smith said this, he said, all sins shall be forgiven except the sin against the Holy Ghost. For Jesus will save all except the sons of perdition. What must a man do to commit the unpardonable sin? He must receive the Holy Ghost, have the heavens opened unto him and know God, and then sin against him. Now, he didn't know it. He didn't say you had to see him. You have to know by the power of the Holy Ghost that God lives. After a man has sinned against the Holy Ghost, there's no repentance for him. He's got to say that the sun does not shine while he sees it. He's got to deny Jesus Christ when the heavens have been opened unto him and to deny the plan of salvation with his eyes, eyes open to the truth of it. From that time, he begins to be an enemy. This is the case with many apostates of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. That's quite a statement. When a man begins to be an enemy to this work, he hunts me, he seeks to kill me, and never ceases to thirst for my blood. He gets the spirit of the devil, the same spirit they had who crucified the Lord of life. That's a strong indictment against those involved in the crucifixion, some of the Jewish leaders. The same spirit that sins against the Holy Ghost. You cannot save such persons. You cannot bring them to repentance. They make open war like the devil, and awful is the consequences. Here's the reference. Teachings of the Prophet Joseph Smith, page 358. Teachings of the Prophet Joseph Smith, page 358. Okay, verse 33. They are vessels of wrath, doomed to suffer the wrath of God with the devil and his angels in eternity, concerning whom I have said there is no forgiveness in this world nor in the world to come. Having denied the Holy Spirit, I would note by that Matthew chapter 12, verse 31 and 32. Matthew 12, 31 and 32. After having received it and having denied the only begotten Son of the Father, who was revealed to them by the power of the Holy Ghost, that witness is stronger than actually seeing the Savior having crucified him unto themselves and put him to an open shame. That means they would crucify him again. That means they come to a point where they hate the Son of God, would destroy him, his kingdom, and all who follow him. Hard to comprehend that kind of evil and that kind of wickedness, where they actually hate the Savior and would like to do away with him. 36. These are they who shall go away into the lake of fire and brimstone of the devil and his angels. Joseph Fielding Smith said this also about denying the Holy Ghost. He said, The testimony of the Spirit is so great, and the impressions and revelations of divine truth so forcefully revealed, that there comes to the recipient a conviction of the truth that he cannot forget. Therefore, when a person once enlightened by the Spirit so that he receives knowledge that Jesus Christ is the only begotten Son of God in the flesh, then turns away and fights the Lord in his work. He does so against the light and testimony he has received by the power of God. Therefore, he has resigned himself to evil knowingly, 
Therefore, Jesus said, there is no forgiveness for such a person. The testimony of the Holy Ghost is the strongest testimony that a man can receive. And that's what we should emphasize and remember, that the strongest witness you can give is not seeing the Son of God, but to have the Holy Ghost give such a witness that he lives. Now, all of us have had a degree of that and have strong testimonies of Christ. The uh, reference for that quote is Joseph Fielding Smith, Answers to Gospel Questions, Volume 4, page 93. Answers to Gospel Questions, Volume 4, page 93. Now, verse 36, this lake of fire and brimstone. I would note by that two references. Mosiah chapter 2, verse 38. Mosiah 2, 38. And then I want to read a small quote from the prophet Joseph. He said, a man is his own tormentor and his own condemner. Hence the saying, they shall go into the lake that burns with fire and brimstone. The torment of disappointment in the mind of man is as exquisite as a lake burning with fire and brimstone. I say, so is the torment of man. Who wants to find out fully what that means? That's the teachings of the prophet Joseph Smith, page 357. The teachings of Joseph Smith, page 357. Verse 37, and the only ones on whom the second death shall have any power, which, which means a final banishment from God never to participate in any degree of glory, 38. Yea, verily, the only ones who shall not be redeemed in due time of the Lord after the sufferings of his wrath. That hasn't got anything to do with the resurrection. They will be resurrected. When it means shall not be redeemed, it means that they will not be removed from Satan's domain. They will not be saved by the atonement in any degree. They will become resurrected, for all the rest shall be brought forth by the resurrection of the dead. In other words, all others eventually will receive some glory, is what that means. Through the triumph and the glory of the Lamb who was slain, who is in the bosom of the Father. 1 Corinthians 15, 21 to 22, makes it clear that all will be resurrected. That includes Cain and all others who become perdition. And anyone who has a physical body can dominate a spirit. So let me tell you the irony of all of this. This being who wanted the throne of God will be how low in his own order, in his own domain someday. For all of those who lived on earth and became perdition will dominate Satan in uh, outer darkness in his final realm. I think that's beautiful irony that will happen to him. Verse 40 through 43 is a summary of the gospel. This is the gospel. And I don't know, I assume the Savior put that in here to change the tone of this for just for a moment. This is the gospel, the glad tidings, which the voice out of the heavens bore record unto us, that he came into the world, even Jesus, Jesus to be crucified for the world and to bear the sins of the world and to sanctify the world and to cleanse it from all unrighteousness. World has reference to the human family, not the earth. That through him all might be saved whom the Father had put into his power and made by him. Who glorifies the Father and saves all the works of his hands except those sons of perdition. Now he goes back to perdition. And he says, who deny the Son after the Father has revealed him. How did the Father reveal the Son? By the power of the Holy Ghost. When you hear people say you have to see the Son of God to be perdition, that is not true. But you must have a sure witness by the power of the Holy Ghost that he is Jesus the Christ. Verse 44. He says, wherefore he saves all except them. They shall go away into everlasting punishment, which is endless punishment, which is eternal punishment, to reign with the devil and his angels in eternity, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched, which is their torment. Their torment never ends. 
Jan Soljil and Hiram Smith, Hiram Smith was a member of the Twelve, said this. They said, think of a place where the evil passions of human beings and evil spirits rage, unrestrained by the influence of the gospel, such as the kingdom of the devil where the sons of perdition will reign. Who can imagine the horror of such a place where not only have they hated us on earth, they hate each other. And uh, it, it has to be a horrible, horrible thing. That's the Doctrine and Covenants Commentary, page 455. Doctrine and Covenants Commentary, page 455. He goes on, the end thereof, neither the place thereof, nor their torment, no man knows, no mortal knows. Neither was it revealed, neither is, neither shall, neither will be revealed unto man, except to them who are made partakers thereof. Nevertheless, now that's a connector. I, the Lord, show it by vision unto many, but straightway shut it up again, which I suggest means this. If we were permitted and could talk to Joseph Smith and we could ask him, did you see the realm where Satan eventually will live? He would say, yes, I did. We would then ask, what was it like? And he would say, I don't know, I can't remember. I think that's what that means, that the Lord has shown it unto many of the prophets, but he shuts it up again. So they don't have to sit and think of the horror of it, but at least they can testify to this extent that the vision they saw was horrible beyond anything you can comprehend. 48, wherefore the end, the width, the height, the depth, and the misery thereof they understand not, neither any man except those who are ordained. Ordained means sentenced or appointed unto this condemnation. We heard the voice saying, write the vision, for lo, this is the end of the vision of the sufferings of the ungodly or the wicked or perdition. Okay, so we've covered perdition. Now the Lord's going to start at the top and work down. Verse 50 through 70. Every verse deals with exaltation in the celestial kingdom. We know later, as we will look in section 131, there are three different degrees in the celestial kingdom. The Savior has given no information on uh, two of those kingdoms. Everything in these 20 verses deal with exaltation. So I suggest to you tonight that if ever there was a block of verses to understand, it has to be these 20 verses right here. Okay, verse 50, we now start with the celestial. And again, we bear record, for we saw and heard. This is the testimony of the gospel of Christ concerning them who shall come forth in the resurrection of the just. In this case, celestial. Come over to verse 64. These are they who shall have part in the first resurrection. Now, terrestrial comes forth in the first resurrection too. We have separated the two by referring to celestial as the morning of the first and the terrestrial as the afternoon, meaning there is a time difference in those. And I don't know, brothers and sisters, if you've ever thought about it, but you and I are within 1,000 years of having celestial bodies. Now, the reason I say that is when the second coming starts, the members of the church who have been true and faithful will begin to be resurrected and celestial. Now, how far into the millennium will be before we're resurrected, I don't know. But it's during that thousand years that the faithful saints will get their celestial bodies. That's why I say we're within about a thousand years of having a resurrected celestial body. And I know that sounds like a long time, but guess what? You will be someplace in a thousand years. And why not live so that you're part of all of this and can have that kind of a body? 51, they are they who received the testimony of Jesus. The testimony of Jesus is revealed knowledge by the power of the Holy Ghost that Jesus is the Christ. There is no other way to know. When you stand in fast meeting or in your Sunday school classes you teach and testify Jesus is the Christ, you have come to know that by the power of the Holy Ghost, and there is no other way to know that. I would note by that teachings of Joseph Smith, page 223, where he will explain the meaning of 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 3, which is a, a critical verse to put there. 
Teachings of Joseph Smith, page 223. The testimony of Jesus then revealed to us by the Holy Ghost because of our obedience, we must have that, and believed on his name. President Dallin Oaks said, to believe on his name refers to believing in his priesthood and its ordinances. Here's the reference. The little book, His Holy Name, page 14. His Holy Name, page 14. We're baptized after the manner of his burial, which means that we are immersed. Being buried in the water in his name, which means priesthood authority. And this according to the commandment which he's given. Which commandment is John chapter 3, verse 5. Long ago when he walked the earth, he made it clear that no one would be in his kingdom that is not baptized. That by keeping the commandments, they might be washed and cleansed from all their sins. That has reference to sanctification. We must become clean. We become sanctified by keeping the commandments of our God and receive the Holy Spirit by the laying on of the hands of him who is ordained, what the ordained there means has authority, and sealed unto this power. The Holy Ghost becomes the sanctifier. He is the cleanser. Joseph Smith said this, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. This eternal truth settles the question of all men's religion. A man may be saved after the judgment in the terrestrial kingdom or in the celestial kingdom, but he can never see the celestial kingdom of God without being born of water and the spirit. History of the Church, Volume 1, page 283. History of the Church, Volume 1, page 283. Verse 53 who overcome by faith, and this is a tough one. This is what it means that we endure the trials. Why did God take away uh, a young couple? Uh, I remember a young couple that uh, he was a work missionary here in the Mountain area, and it was a, a good young man, and later was married, and him and his wife was on a honeymoon, and was hit head on and she was killed instantly. And the question, why? Why did that happen? The answer, I don't know, it's not my kingdom. I have no idea, you can't answer all of those things. Why is it that uh, parents wait for years to have a child and then the child, as I mentioned, the one story drowns when it, the girl's three years old and I don't know. Why is it that a man who's so true and faithful and his wife also, their house burns down. I don't know. But I do know what that means. It says overcome by faith, which means they endure the tests and the trials. There's no way off of this earth without getting worked over. If you haven't had any tests or trials yet, just be patient. Uh, you'll get your full share. Are sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise. That is critical. We might deceive priesthood leaders. I heard... Uh, uh, a general authority one time say, he said, I believe occasionally, and he said, now I want to qualify. He said, I don't think this can happen very often. He said, where well, you might deceive a bishop and a stake president, but he said, you cannot deceive a general authority. He said, it cannot be done. And I thought, who would want to try? All ordinances, that's your baptism, your confirmation, your priesthood ordinations, your temple marriage, all ordinances must be sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise, which is an office and function of the Holy Ghost. Until he seals that ordinance, it will not stand valid in the eternal worlds. That's why I don't know whether to laugh or to cry when I hear a couple married in the temple say, do I have to live with him or her in the next life? And the answer is no. If you can't resolve things and if one's disobedient and the other's righteous, the Holy Ghost will never seal a marriage. And it will not be binding. Because you've been married in the temple is not a guarantee that you'll have eternal life. Okay, that's probably enough on that to ruin your day. Which the Father sheds forth upon all those who are just and true. Note that. That's the promise. He will shed that power forth on all who are just and true. 
They are they who are the church of the firstborn. That means they are heirs, heirs to all of the promises of God. Joseph Fielding Smith stated this. He said, there will be many who are members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints who shall never become members of the Church of the Firstborn. Baptism opens the door into the earthly church, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Temple marriage opens the door for uh, uh, membership in the Church of the Firstborn and exaltation. Now here are the references for that. Joseph Fielding Smith, Doctrines of Salvation, Volume 2, page 41 and 42. Doctrines of Salvation, Volume 2, 41, page 41, 42. And then the statement I just made about baptism into the earthly church is Mormon Doctrine, page 139, Mormon Doctrine 139. Verse 55, they are they into whose hands the Father has given all things. Why has he done that? because they can be trusted. They're true and faithful. They are they who are priests and kings who have received of his fullness and of his glory, which means this. One must go to the temple to begin to qualify to become what? A king and a queen, a priest and a priestess. So what does it mean then when it says that we will rule over all things? It means we'll become kings and queens and priests and priestesses. A king rules over a political kingdom, a temporal kingdom. And a priest rules over a spiritual kingdom. Now what is there outside of temporal and spiritual? It's another way of summarizing the rights and privilege of those who are in the church of the firstborn. They are priests of the Most High after the order of Melchizedek. Uh, in other words, they hold the Melchizedek priesthood. Now, Doctrine and Covenants 84, verse 33 through 44 explains how one honors the priesthood. We'll look at that when we get to that particular uh, section. 58, wherefore, as it is written, they are gods, even the sons of God. Why? Because of the priesthood. They have honored it. They've kept the commandments. They have become exalted beings. Wherefore, all things are theirs, whether life or death. It doesn't matter whether we receive the promises here or they're eventually given to us in the paradise. If we'll be true and faithful, there will come some point in the mortal probation, which does not end until the resurrection, whereby we will know we have a place in the church of the firstborn and will stand with the Son of God one day. 60, they shall overcome all things. That's a statement of fact. This particular group who meets all those requirements will overcome all things, whatever they're asked to do. Lorenzo Snow reached a point in his life where he knelt in prayer and he said, Father in heaven, there isn't anything you can ask me to do that I will not do. If you want my life, it is yours. Elder Boyd K. Packer said the hardest thing for a member of the church to learn to do, and it takes a long time and effort, is to turn your agency to God. Now think about that. We will not give up our agency. We love that freedom. And to reach a point where we turn it over to God will take a great deal of time and effort to do that. 61, wherefore let no man glory in man. In man. I want to show you why. Uh, I'm going to take a few minutes to do this. Turn to Isaiah chapter 2. And I always, I refer to Isaiah and Psalms as the book of books. These are the two books in the Old Testament to really come to understand. Isaiah chapter 2, verse 22. Note what this great prophet said. Cease ye from man, mortal man, whose breath is in his nostrils. Now think of that. If I was to set you on a chair and tie you tight, and then I was to tape your mouth shut so you can't open it, all I have to do is to end your life is take those two fingers and pinch your nostril, and you're dead. And that is what he's saying. Mortal man's life is what? It's in his nostrils. In other words, it doesn't take much to end a mortal man's life. Why then would we trust in mortal man versus the living God who can give life and can resurrect us and bring us into his holy presence. 
Okay, I would put by that verse Isaiah chapter 2, verse uh, 22, which maybe will be of help to you. Rather let him glory in God, who shall subdue all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be conquered will be death for all of us, the physical death. These shall dwell in the presence of God in his Christ forever and ever. That is our final destiny, brothers and sisters, to dwell in the presence of the Father and the Son forever and forever. These are they whom he shall bring with him when he shall come in the clouds of heaven. I'd put by that doctrine, Covenants 88, verse 96 to 98. 88, 96 to 98. That's one of the great promises in all of Scripture that when the Savior descends in glory, all faithful saints in the paradise on earth, the city of Enoch, all of us will be caught up and taken to the presence of the Savior. How long it will take to organize us uh, in that vast company, I don't know, and how it works, I obviously don't know. But we descend with him in glory at the second coming. We are not silent spectators who stand on this earth and watch him come in his glory, we get to come with him. These are they who shall have part in the first resurrection. These are they who shall come forth in the resurrection of the just. These are they who are come unto Mount Zion and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly place, the holiest of all. The sign over the city will say, uh, the city of holiness, only one has that name. Do you know who it is? It is God the Father. He is called man of holiness. Christ is called the son of man. So if the sign says the city of holiness, there will come a time when the Father will be there also. And we will be allowed to see him and he will love and help us. These are they who have come to an innumerable company of angels to the General Assembly and Church of Enoch. The Church of Enoch, church there means uh, uh, an assembly, a, a congregation, a group of people, okay? It's not his private church. And of the firstborn, note how many will be exalted, an innumerable company. I suggest to you tonight there will literally be billions who will come off this earth that will be exalted, men and women. We will be among them. We just have to hold a steady course, keep the commandments. These are they whose names are written in heaven where God and Christ are the judge of all. That then assures absolute fairness. None of us will be missed. The Father knows every one of us and so does the Son. These are they who are just men made perfect. Now we say Jesus is the only perfect man that ever lived. That means he never sinned. But we are made perfect perfect through his atonement as though we had never sinned that's what it means in genesis chapter 6 verse 9 when it says that noah was a perfect man in his generation he reached such a point of righteousness that he's made clean through the healing power of the atonement thus he becomes what a just man made perfect through the atonement of christ and that's what that means Seventy, these are they whose bodies are celestial, whose glory is that of the sun, even the glory of God, the highest of all. In other words, we will become like our Father in heaven with celestial bodies. I'll show you later in another revelation. It's going to take a little time to do that, which I'm sure that we're familiar with and would understand that being resurrected does not ensure that all of a sudden we're like our Father in heaven. It'll take a long time to be able to do that. Now, verse 71 through 80 deals with the terrestrial, and I have to do these a little bit quicker. It lists four groups who will go into terrestrial glory. Uh, 72, behold, these are they who died without law. That has reference to the heathen. Melvin J. Ballard stated this. He said, now those who died without law, meaning the pagan nations, for lack of faithfulness, for lack of devotion in the former life, are obtaining all that they are entitled to. I don't mean to say that all of them will be barred from entrance into the highest glory. Any one of them who repents and complies with the conditions might also obtain celestial glory. 
Here it comes. But the great bulk of them will only obtain terrestrial glory because they never did enough in pre-earth life to obtain anything more than that. That comes from Ellen J. Ballard, Crusader for Righteousness, page 221. Crusader for Righteousness, page 221. Okay, there's one group, 73. Also they who are the spirits of men kept in prison, whom the Son visited, and preached the gospel unto them. Now, DNC 138 explains what happened there, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh. 74, who received not the testimony of Jesus in the flesh, but afterwards received it. They heard the gospel. It was explained to them while they were in mortality. They rejected it. Then in the great prison, when the missionaries found them, they accepted the highest they can go is terrestrial glory. 75, third group, these are they who are honorable men of the earth, who are blinded by the craftiness of men, honorable, decent, good men and women who just cannot accept the fullness of the gospel. All who served as missionaries have met such people, wonderful people. You wish somehow you could have reached them but were unable to. Now the fourth group is a scary one, 79. Here's the fourth one. These are they who are not valiant in the testimony of Jesus. Wherefore, they obtain not the crown over the kingdom of our God. Elder Neil A. Maxwell said this. A second group of members are honorable but not valiant. They're not really aware of the gap nor of the importance of closing it. These honorable individuals are certainly not miserable nor wicked, nor are they unrighteous and unhappy. It's not what they have done, but what they've left undone that is amiss. For example, if valiant, they could touch others deeply instead of merely being remembered pleasantly. He had a beautiful way with words. That comes out of the conference report, October 1995, page 27. Conference report, October 1995, 27. Okay, that's all I have time to do on that one. Verse 81 to 91 is telestial. I'm going to give you a summary of this, and then I just want to look at something else, and I apologize for having to do this. Here's a summary of the verses. One, they have the glory of the stars. They're as different as the stars. If you look out on a beautiful summer night at the stars, some of them are really bright. Others you can barely see. They're so dim. That's how different they'll be in celestial glory. That's the variance of degree of glory in that domain. Two, these reject the gospel, both sides of the veil. Three, they don't deny the Holy Ghost, thus they're not perdition. Four, these are thrust down to hell. The gate to celestial glory is you must go via hell to come to glory. Now, let me show you why it is so serious. Come over here to 98. The glory of the celestial is one, even as the glory of the stars is one. For as one star differs from another star in glory, even so differs one from another in glory in the celestial world. Now, here's the reason why they go to the celestial kingdom. Here it comes. These are they who are of Paul and of Apollos and of Cephas, these are they who say they are some of one and some of another, some of Christ and some of John, some of Moses, some of Elias, some of Isaiah, some of Isaiah and some of Enoch. These are those who pick and choose apostles and prophets that they will support and honor. These are those who accept Joseph Smith, Brigham Young, and John Taylor and reject Wilford Woodruff because he ended plural marriage. These are those who reject Spencer W. Kimball because he allowed all worthy men to hold the holy Melchizedek priesthood. Now, what does it mean then that they support Paul, Apollos, and Cephas? It means that they spiritually murder members of this church, and that is serious. If you apostatize because you reject a prophet or a member of the, uh, of the twelve, and then you do everything in your power to take your family out of the kingdom of God and others too. The highest you can go in the world to come is telestial. And the gate to telestial is hell. That's how serious that is to murder spiritually a member of this church and to take them out of the church. 
And most of us have seen that and are aware of that, and it is sad. Note who else goes there. Verse 103, these are they who are liars, sorcerers, adulterers, whoremongers, whosoever loves and makes a lie. In the book of Revelation, it adds to that murders. Murders can get into celestial glory. And that's Revelation chapter 20, verse 8. Now, let me explain verse 103. You can repent of lying. You can repent of being of an adulterer and so forth. I used to wonder, what does that mean then that they go uh, to hell to get into celestial glory? It means this. They are guilty of repetition of sin. They continually lie. They continually commit immoral acts. And there comes a point where the Savior, in effect, says, you mock the atonement that I worked out for you. You go out of the atonement, you will make payment. Now, at what point that happens, I don't know. That would be between the Savior and the individual. But that's what that has reference to. Note 106, these are they who are cast down to hell. A terrible, terrible condition that they must pass through which was their choice. Elder McConkie said this, he said, unity within the church and among the saints is the goal of the gospel. There's no place in the church of God for division, for disagreement on doctrine, for cults and cliques, for liberal views as contrasted with conservative concepts. And that's what he has reference to with this one verse, that, or two, 99 and 100. They divide the church. They take people away. They destroy spiritually. Now, back up to verse 104. These are they who suffer the wrath of God on earth, which means they are burned at the second coming. If they're here with their mortal bodies when he comes, they will be removed by fire. And then finally, let's go to uh, 115. He says, which he commanded us, we should not write while we are yet in the spirit and are not lawful for man to utter. There were things in the vision that they were not to write, nor were they to tell. I would put by that history of the church, volume five, page 402. I apologize for going through so much so fast. There was things that we didn't have time to do. But hopefully, at least you have a glimpse of the significance of that revelation. And I close tonight in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Brother Stevens. Um, wow, what a powerful two sections. Uh, that 76 is one of my favorites. And... Um, Thank you for enlightening us on that. Um, also, as a reminder, we'll be our last uh, class for this uh, before the summer will be May 6th. We will be starting up the third Thursday in September again, so please make note of that. Last day will be May 6th, and we'll be starting up again the third week, um, third Thursday in September. Um, we'll go ahead and have a closing prayer now by Sister Leah Reynoldsbach from the Stoddard Ward. Our dear kind Father in heaven, we are so grateful for the opportunity we have to feast in the words that thou hast prepared for us. We are grateful for the knowledge that can be expounded upon us and that we can learn and grow and be reminded of the ways that we can stay on the straight and narrow path, the true way to thee. Please help us as we go this night that we will get the things accomplished that we have set forth. 